everybody, and uh, welcome to uh, Monetizing Voice. Show me the money, Monetizing Voice. Here's Mike Rascala joining us. Um, thank you for joining this Open Voice Network webinar. Um, I'm going to ask Megan and Mike if you can hear me clearly, and Nathan at Linux Foundation. Yeah, okay, good. Um, so this is the third of these uh, webinars covering uh, the topic of monetization of voice. And uh, before I talk a little bit about the mission of the uh, webinar and some of the past guests that we've had and introductions of our current guests, I will, in accordance with Linux Foundation protocol, read the antitrust policy notice, uh, the Open Voice Network, is brought to all of us under the auspices of the Linux Foundation. Linux Foundation meetings involve participation by industry competitors, and it is the intention of the Linux Foundation to conduct all of its activities in accordance with applicable antitrust and anti, excuse me, and competition laws. It is therefore extremely important that attendees adhere to meeting agendas and be aware of and not participate in any activities that are prohibited under applicable US state, federal, or foreign antitrust and competition laws. Examples of types of actions that are prohibited at Linux Foundation meetings and in connection with Linux Foundation activities are described in the Linux Foundation antitrust policy available at linuxfoundation.org. So thank you very much for uh, your patience. Um, we're very excited. This is the third, as I said, of uh, the series that we began last year. And past panelists um, are part of an impressive, accomplished group uh, who've left their, who've lent their expertise and given generously of their time to join us in the past um, to help us all really gain a deeper understanding of voice technology, where it's heading, and its use cases. And in particular, how voice itself is going to be monetized. Um, people like Roger Kibbe of Samsung and Ron Jaworski of Trinity Audio, Rupal Patel of Veritone, Shamala Paragya, excuse me, Prayaga of Nvidia, and Brandon Kaplan of, uh, of Skilled Creative. We've talked about automotive and retail and the entertainment sectors. Um, with real and potential use cases for monetization. And uh, both of those webinars, and they're highly valued, they're, you know, with that expertise, highly valuable uh, content, they're available at the Open Voice Network website. Um, today, we are honored equally with uh, this impressive panel, and I'm just gonna randomly introduce, first, Mike Rascala uh, is, you can wave, Mike. Uh, to the crowd. Um, Mike is founder and CEO of Snorble Inc. He is a serial entrepreneur, a longtime creative in digital robotics and now voice uh, via his creation Snorble, which we hope to hear more and more about later. Uh, welcome Mike uh, to the panel. Thank you, Don. Thank you for having me, everybody. It's, it's uh, great to be on the panel with y'all. Uh, full disclosure, I do work with Mike uh, as co-head of Lullaboo Studios, which is uh, a division of uh, Snorbel, and I have a consulting uh, partnership with, uh, with, with Mike in that regard. Um, next, Megan Burns is a, a strategic connector, a senior director in the venture firm uh, Azafran Capital Partners, where Megan provides strategic and marketing council in the company's catalyst program designed to accelerate growth for entrepreneurs and early stage startups. Welcome, Megan. I believe you're coming to us from Philadelphia, right? Thank you, Donald. I'm so happy to be here. Um, thanks for joining us. Finally, um, James Poulter, one of the most widely known, highly regarded and deeply respected figures in the voice ecosystem and beyond into the realm of consumer behavior research, thought leadership, marketing, media, and strategy. We're happy to have you with us today. 
Welcome, James. Thanks, Don, for that overly grandiose introduction. <laughs> Appreciate it. I don't think it was overly grandiose at all. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to run for about 35, 45 minutes. Um, we'll, we'll have opportunity for, for questions at the end. Uh, Nathan Southern is, is going to help us um, curate those questions. And um, we're just going to build this as a conversation. We, uh, we want it to be freewheeling and, uh, and creative. And let it, let's just let it go wherever it may go. Um, but I have to begin somewhere. So I'm going to flip my notes. And um, I'm going to start with James. Um, what's all this chat GPT mean for voice? How's it, how's, it, how's, it, how's it going to affect us? Is it a utility? Is it, uh, is it something that's going to help accelerate development in voice? Is it yeah. yet another tool? What, let's hear your thoughts. Yeah, I had a feeling you were going to ask this. So, um, so I think where we we see things right now is that yeah, you know, obviously ChatGPT as it currently is, it's it's a large language model deployment, right? Of of what is GPT three sitting behind, um, yeah, you know, kind of a, a nice chatbot interface. It's a nice consumerization of this big technology that actually has been around for for a little while longer. Um, and so you know, we're seeing loads of influencer content kind of coming out right now. Lots of people saying this this is the great use case of it, that that's the great use case of it. And more power to them, keep going. But I think what's more interesting um, really than the, the front end interface and what ChatGPT currently um, is today is more what it signifies that we can expect to come, particularly through the investment that Microsoft have within OpenAI. Um, they've just announced today that they're going to be uh, including this as a part of Azure Cloud. It's going to now become uh, you know, access to the chat GPT, well, to the GPT-3 and DALI um, and other um, open AI uh, services via Azure. And that's just going to open it up to a huge wave of potential developer applications, um, which obviously has been possible up until now. You can go and apply for your own licenses and start deploying it. But I think embedding this inside of something as uh, robust as Azure and on a, as big a scale as Microsoft are able to do so is going to completely change that game. Um, but what it also signifies, I think, is from a broader perspective, um, is that we very similarly to the early days of Alexa and Google Assistant, we're seeing a second wave of consumer interest in conversational AI. Um, and with that second wave of interest comes new investment into the marketplace, uh, new applications being developed, but also uh, a rise in consumer acceptance of, oh, I'm going to talk to a AI-driven personality of some description, and I'm going to use it for far more complex tasks than turning my lights on and off and you know adding things to my shopping list. And it's that, it's the potential that then comes with that that is the thing that we should be paying the most interest with. And then when you begin to think about pairing that technology, the actual large language model technology with synthetic voice creation, with avatar creation, um, and then plugging it into the knowledge graphs of Alexa, Google Assistant, um, and, and many others, um, that's when the commercial applications really begin to uh, come to the fore. Um, and yeah, we need at all times with any of these things, consumer acceptance to rise and consumer demand to rise and a, a robust developer ecosystem to rise at the same time. Um, and arguably we can see that there was demand with things like Google Assistant, but the developer ecosystem didn't come at the same strength or similarly with Bixby. Alexa kind of has gotten there, but there's you know, still a closed ecosystem. Um, but what we're seeing now is this potential that these two things might rise at the same time um, with also just a huge demand uh, from, from the industry for efficiency um, in the wake of the pandemic. So I think all of those factors are com coming together at the same time, and it's why you're seeing such a big swirl um, in the media um, right now um, as to why this is uh, you know, becoming such a, what, what may become such a fundamental technology uh, baseline for us um, in the coming months and years ahead. Yeah, and you, you, uh... You went where I was hoping you would go with with that topic, insofar as consumer acceptance and the developer community moving together in tandem towards the destination, whatever that might be, opens the door for monetization of all of the above. And we don't know what those things are going to be quite yet. But you know, when Microsoft starts talking about investments of the size and scope that they have been talking about, 
we know uh, we can have a certain degree of confidence that uh, there is ample opportunity for monetization. Uh, Mike, did you have a, a, a comment on that? Yeah, you know, first off, uh, I thought that was a great commentary, James. So thank you. That was really good. Very, very thorough. So thank you for that. Um, you know, I, I look at things a little bit um, differently in, in the sense of, you know, it's a new platform. It still is very much new platform in the sense of, you know, the developer community that's existed around it has not been fully, uh, um, has not been really as, as, as robust as it has been in the recent years, right? So, so what happens is, is that a lot of the times too, uh, as well, because the platforms have been fairly closed in terms of what you can do with them, like a lot of the primary platforms that we've been using, whether it be uh, via, uh, you know, Alexa or, or whatever have been closed off. So but the interesting thing about chat, chat GPT from my perspective is um, it's far more open. You know, it gives the, uh, it gives the groups an opportunity to really do, uh, or the, the developers to really do something unique uh, in that way. But then the other aspect that I think is really important, and this happens a lot with any new medium, I really look at voice as a medium. It's not, it's not necessarily like its own, uh, it, it, it's an input for, for a series of different uh, uh, perspective opportunities, right? And uh, I talked a lot about this in terms of AR, VR way back in the day. And at the mean, Donna had actually had a conversation about that maybe a little while ago, where like at the time I, I was uh, speaking at the AR, VR conference, maybe, I don't know, six, seven years ago. And one of the things that really, uh, that I was really focused on was that it wasn't just about the medium. It was actually about the experience, leveraging everything related to, in, in that regard, voice, AI, uh, context to the user and how that and how that applies. And I think that that's a big part of where the opportunity lies. It's not it's not necessarily for the purist, right? It could be in, in a way about the combination of those technologies together to give some really true value. And, and the other thing that I find really, really exciting about this is because it's bringing a lot of players to the table. You know, I saw a, uh, and I don't know if this is true, so if I'm giving false facts, call me out on this, please, because I could be, but, you know, we were talking about the 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 time it took for, uh, basically for uh, ChatGPT to get up to a million users. And I don't know, I can't remember what the metric was, but it was astonishing. It was like within a few days, I believe to get up to a million users, something astronomical in comparison to so many other platforms, right? Where it taken months or years to get up to the same level of users. So that in itself is fantastic because one of the biggest challenges is, is that we inherently are used to, or like what happens with any of these new technologies is from a user experience perspective, we transition um, uh, the ability to do things from a, another platform over to new platforms. You know, uh, I always refer to the mail icon. The mail icon is one of my favorite, uh, you know, when, when they first decided, okay, here's how we're going to communicate on computers. We had a little mail icon, <laughs> you know, right? And then through the evolution, you know, whether it be IRC all the way up to Slack now, you know, those are different uh, approaches to how we communicate using and leveraging uh, a technology from years ago, right? So one of the really exciting things, and I think this is going to be uh, uh, where we start to see some big wins, is the merger of all these technologies. When this become, when this medium becomes uh, kind of a, a staple, it becomes part of just how we do everything, right? And how does that impact, you know, when we talk about revenue, how does it impact uh, revenue for sure, but also how does that impact the overall experience, you know? So. I'm glad you. Uh, I'm glad you went that way, and it, it gives me an opportunity to do two things. No, number number one, uh, I want to talk to Megan a little bit about the connections that you've both both James and Mike have suggested. That you know, what is this? And Alan Furstenberg will appreciate the fact that I'm pulling it back to the notion of voice and the monetization of voice itself. Um, but we can't ignore the issue of connectivity. Megan, you are the master connector. What do you see in the landscape, the development community, the voice practitioners, and I'm talking about conversation designers and developers and uh, the creative people behind the deployments and, and the executives that are now joining the ranks of, of uh, the voice ecosystem startups. What do you make of all of the, the the latest generative uh, uh, developments, AI developments, chat GPT, what does it do? How is it all gonna interact and connect for us 
and help um, drive revenue for companies yeah. or, or provide opportunities for efficiencies. Yeah, thanks, Donald. Well, um, to what Mike had said, in, um, with As a Friends Catalyst, we um, really kind of kicked the tires on technology, assessing the marketplace for timing and traction. And often, if the consumer adaptability is not there, um, take, uh, for example, Oculus, um, you know, 10 years ago, it just wasn't ready. So that's a good example of that. <clears throat> One of our managing partners, Marty Fisher, was the president of AOL Technology back in the day. And he is very, very uh, much around layering the technology, Mike, as you're saying. Um, but as far as for the commercialization, which is, again, my focus on connecting technology, it is often layered. It's the, um, it's the struggle that companies have, whether it's an enterprise, regardless of verticals, of their uh, resources that they have to um, bring the technology into um, their, whether it's their product or service and their resources. Um, so just actually this morning, I had a call with somebody today that was looking to connect um, of AI conversational technology to manufacturers um, in China. And uh, he said, where do I find all the different technologies available today? Right. And you and I have talked a little bit about that um, in terms of um, education is paramount in the in the in the in the in the road to monetization that uh, you must have a greater awareness, which I think goes back to James's point earlier on the first question about how um, the emergence and you know the buzziness of of Chat GPT has uh, has uh, once again brought this second wave of awareness uh, to voice. Um, you shared a concept with me recently, there cannot be growth without education. And um, I think you've just expanded upon that uh, very nicely. You got ahead of my questions, but um, I want to go for a second back to, uh, to Mike Rascala, just to avoid repetition of past webinars where we have covered the media industries, the health and wellness communities. We've done a little bit of automotive. What we haven't done before is voice, uh, device-based conversational AI, device-based mm. NLP. Mike, can you tell us all what is Snorble? Tell us about the origin of Snorble. Tell us about the edge computing involved in Snorble and its advantages. Fill us in and then maybe we can uh, sort of go around the table and talk about device-based and the opportunity for monetization in that corner. Yeah, for sure. And, and just to be clear, device-based is the hardest. <laughs> as, as what it's, it's, not, it's, not for, it's not for the faint at heart, if I can say that. Um, and, and in part, uh, you know, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the background on Snorble, sorry. So what Snorble is, Snorble essentially is an animated character that's been brought to life. We focused our energy on really, um, if you could imagine taking a character right out of the TV set that a kid could fall in love with. And in part because I, we love characters and story. We all inherently love characters and story, right? So when you bring a character to life and the character can exist in your own world and be part of your day to day, well, the opportunities for experience are just incredible, right? And you can really create some real magic in terms of the experience that you create for uh, children, children and their families, but also for us grown adults as well as well too, right? Um, so, so one of the things that we do at Snorble is, is that we take that same um, idea of being able to create these characters and bring them to life. And we leverage that to inspire the minds of kids. And through that, we can do things that are good for them. So our system is a closed system and it's closed on purpose because we have young kids um, that, we're, that we're trying to uh, bring this product to. And that's important for families. We don't want them exposed to anything that might be harmful or bad for them, right? And then through that, through that, uh, it gives us, uh, and th through the platform that we've created, what we've done is we've really honed in on not just um, the entertainment value, because it is pretty fun and cute and adorable, but also education. And we have an entire educational infrastructure that we're putting in place over the course of the next year um, that will uh, essentially uh, allow us to develop and grow with the child and progress with the child. And that's a really exciting proposition. So what happens when characters exist in your world? And, you know, uh, we talked a lot about, um, you know, we talked a lot about uh, monetization, obviously, because we're a business, we're trying to, we're also trying to make money. 
uh, but we have a mission as well too. And then they, they can be equally uh, paired, which, which in our case they are. Um, but the focus is, from my perspective is, is that when you create really enriched experiences, um, there is opportunity, there's a, a lot of opportunity to monetize that. So for example, um, you know, having a character that exists in your world, being able to extend the experience, whether it be for educational purposes, entertainment purposes, seasonal purposes, whatever it might be, uh, all those opportunities exist. And further, one of the other things to take note of is, is that it's not just about your medium. It's actually about the person. And I think that's where a lot of product people fall, fall a little bit sideways. You know, it's like, well, hey, we have this great, you know, app for parking, you know, or wh whatever it could be, whatever, whatever it might be, right? But in reality, you know, those situations where you might need that service or you might need that that ability to do things is not essentially when your phone is locked and closed, right? So the opportunity is, is how many touch points and how many connection points can you have with your, with your audience where you're giving them inherent value? And that's where I think we're, uh, where I'm really excited about what we're doing and also, uh, also what the team's already accomplished uh, so far uh, for Snorble, but also what I'm really excited to see happen from all the great uh, uh, access to the to these new platforms, you know, and, and even an open ended platform like, for example, uh, ChatGPT, right? Here's a here's a I, I actually have a question. I want to pull you back to the cash register for a second okay. too, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and make sure we 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 talk about get it. We have we have a clear understanding of what you're talking about um, for monetization, whether it is. Um, whether it is product extensions or subscriptions yeah. or what you have in mind. And then interestingly, and I'm doing my best to keep up with the questions that are coming up in the chat um, and still listening to our panelists, but we do have uh, a relevant question, which we can, we can attend to first from Nancy Monroe. Um, I'm curious how you are accounting for capturing a child's voice which may not be as clear to NLP engines. Yes. I so know I, this is a, a topic close to your heart. So when we set out at the very beginning, we fundamentally had, uh, and this is a standard thing for product. We try to find what our unique value proposition is, right? So our unique value proposition was in threefold. One was we wanted to bring an animated character to life. And that meant that a robotic voice wouldn't work for us. We needed something that felt real, personality, character, right? The second thing was, it needed to understand young children. So one of the approaches that we took at the very beginning was we, we basically set out to prove that we could uh, train a model to understand younger kids, right? And of course, you know, I, I know that the, all, all of you folks will know this, but the more data we get, the better it will be. But we're really, really focused on, on, on being able to understand young kids. And that's part of, part, of the, uh, part of the aspect of what we're doing. The third thing, which was even harder, so if you, I, I know if, if for any of you, um, uh, AI scientists out there, you're going to hate this. I also want to make sure that it was it was commercially viable. So when we first set out on our mission, we uh, we actually ended up uh, testing and working towards uh, um, uh, solving for the these speech algorithms to work on um, you know six dollar off the shelf processors, right? So big challenges, big big challenges, and 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 part of that is. You have to systematically go through the process of testing, refining, adapting, figuring out what's going to work, what's not going to work, and and you know, if, especially if you're going on device and on edge. So those were all part part of it. Right, James. Um, throwing it back to you for a second. Voice, whether it is um, whether it is a an input or whether it is a product feature. Uh, I would argue that, uh, that you know, automotive deployment of voice is a product feature that, that helps sell cars uh, if, if, if done well. Um, Mike's Snorble product is more frontally about the conversational functionality of the product. Where, where do we go with all of this in terms of voice as input, voice as utility, and voice as the front and center element of the product that's out there. Where is the monetization most likely to take place? 
from your from your seat? Well, I mean, I think that will very much depend on where where you're coming from in terms of your your application and and where you're trying to deploy. I think we've just come back from um, from CES uh, a couple of weeks ago, and yeah, you, know, you only had to walk the the automotive hall to see voice, you know, very widely deployed um, in every new car, in every EV, but not just in the car where it's the interface for the car, but in the app for the car, in the app for checking what my you know kind of charge status is of my car, or doing routing information, or managing media, or you know preheating the seats and stuff. So you then have it as the interface in the car, you have it as the interface in the application, but then you also have, you know, kind of mobility companies also looking to voice as part of their overall kind of ecosystem, whether that's when you roll up to a parking garage and you can talk to the interface on, on a screen to you know, book your parking slot or, you know, kind of manage you know, your flight information when you roll up at the uh, airport parking or something like that. So you'll see voice show up in lots of these different, uh, different spaces. In terms of the opportunity now, as and um, particularly as we think of our conversation thus far, like related to some of these new language models and these kind of essentially, um, you know, off-platform, off-third-party platform, that's where this real ecosystem thing is beginning to shift. Because up until now, and as we've seen, you know, before, we've got lots of people training their own models developing their own bespoke AIs for specific use cases. And that was one route that you could go down. Or the other route you would go down is building on top of one of the big language model or one of the big models um, with uh, its own device ecosystem like Alexa or Google or Samsung. And we're now seeing with things like OpenAI, a kind of third way, which is a large language model with applications and APIs and developer ecosystem at massive scale, but not locked into a specific hardware ecosystem and not rec- and but still leaving open the potential for you to build applications that can run on your bespoke hardware ecosystem Mm -hmm. and that's where yeah we needed the kind of industry i think to kind of get to is this position where you can begin to create custom applications you could embed this into your own head unit of a car or into an app or into a toy or you know that kind of whole you know i come from the kind of the toys industry right that kind of whole toys to life kind of category um for a long time was completely unviable for us because the cost of actually doing both the hardware and the software was just never gonna really kind of match up and now we're beginning to see that that might be possible so i think um you know and i've seen alan's comments and stuff in the chat as well nice to see um you know where is the opportunity for us and broadly speaking, as members of the Open Voice Network and those that are here, us as the developer ecosystem, I think it's in all of those places. Uh, there will be people that will build brand new products that are entirely based upon these new language models and these new AI tools combined together. There will be some that will just take those new tools and re- deploy them to existing ecosystems they're already building for. Um, I don't think I think you, know, you can imagine the collaboration between Amazon and Microsoft, the collaboration between Microsoft and OpenAI. It's not going to be long before you begin to see these things being connected together um, across different you know, kind of um, platforms. Um, and then in terms of you know, kind of the actual opportunity that this stuff gives, yeah, I saw that comment earlier on about does you know just awareness um actually lead to monetization mm-hmm. i don't think there's a direct line there but i don't think one exists without the other <laughs> um and so i think that that you know the awareness is it has to be there and yes equally you know a- alexa has made a-, a lot of money for amazon despite what you might read in the the papers about it as a business unit it still makes an awful lot of money for amazon as a business in the way in which it has become a fundamental way of them putting a you know robot in every you know kind of home up and down the country um that carries massive value whether or not it has you know whether it sits well on their own balance sheet or not so i think um there is there is opportunities there for for creating value um but i think in the the short term it's going to change the shape of the way that we extract that value from uh for different companies and, and different organizations yeah just um uh, going back to Megan for a second and the and the notion of of um education awareness and um tying it back ultimately to you know the reason for this webinar making money um the startups the young companies that you encounter from day to day um are they bringing new knowledge new information to the broader ecosystem of vc are they um are they in fact um helping raise the bar uh educating investors, uh, educating institutions about the uh, the technological advances that are happening 
uh, the cliches that they happen in, in garages, but uh, we, we know better, but they're happening in places like that. Um, what's your, what is your, what are you finding out there in your universe? Yeah, thanks, Don. Um, well, as James said, I saw them at CES in uh, Vegas, and Don, I know you were at, at, at NRF. Um, one of our companies in Azafran, Yobi, just announced uh, mm. a partnership with Soundhound in a, um, in a quick serve restaurant. I'm forgetting the name of it, but you know their mission on human to machine interaction and voice enabled products. So, um, you know, you'll be is considered a startup and it's in our environments, whether it's open voice uh, network, it's uh, the voice summit, CES, uh, technology uh, uh, entrepreneurs and owners, regardless of their size is br bringing their expertise on problems that exist in the marketplace. Um, and again, going into that layered technology, a, a technology on its own is very rare that it's not going to couple up with something else. So it's that collaboration um, with other uh, technologists and technology. Yeah, I, I, um, I was quite surprised, happily so, uh, and not to make this personal, but my experience yesterday was, was rather eye-opening over at the Jacob Javits Center, um, where I somewhat reluctantly appeared on this 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 panel in a in a um, the national um, uh, retail uh, federation gathering, which was massive. Uh, I think I, I compared it to Comic Con before. It was Comic Con for retailers, and you know I, I thought I'm not a retail guy. I'm a movies and television guy, entertainment. I'm a marketer. I'm a little bit of a voice guy now, but um, I'm not really qualified to speak to the <laughs> to the retail trade. Uh, so I did my best to make the connections, and um, one of my sort of feints to do that was to come at it as a marketer, uh, because if you're marketing in the retail business, uh, it's not all that different from uh, marketing in the entertainment uh, business. And uh, an example that I provided, which was very well received, I was also so pleased that nobody walked out of my presentation, uh, which is always a good sign. Um, and it was fairly well attended. But one of the examples I gave was, you know, imagine you're in your car, and I would love to have commentary from everyone on the panel on this. Imagine you're in your car, it's the evening, you decide with your family or your partner or a friend that you wanna see a movie, you, buy your movie tickets or you do a search for the latest Knives Out um, film where it might be playing uh, or might not be playing in a movie theater near you. You book your reserved seat tickets. Maybe you order a bucket of large popcorn and a couple of Coca-Colas in advance. And you do all of this with your voice. You might do it from your car. You might do it from your hearables, wearables, your mobile device, however you do it, you're doing it. Um, you might do it from Alexa. That's even possible. Um, you get to the theater, there's no paper transaction. The ticket taker is a voice enabled robotic entity. You say your name and you're in. And similarly, you pick up your snacks, you go to your seat and you're done. The entire transaction has happened through voice technology and of course, you know, a lot of backend. Um, but what intrigued me about that journey, that experience was that all along the way, there were opportunities for brands to expose you to conversational messages about them, about their products. So the robotic entity that took your ticket at the movie theater could be an animated character come to life. It could be an opportunity for promotional branding for the next film that's coming to the theater. Could be part of the dialogue, could be part of the conversation, could be part of the graphics package that uh, presents you with this robotic character at the movie theater. Lots and lots of uh, opportunities along these journeys from the so-called top of the funnel all the way to the transaction um do you see as i do the potential for some of this as we grow and therefore generate money in media generate money in the companies that supply the materials to create a journey like this yeah is it b2b 
more than B2C? Uh, just to jump in, I think that it's absolutely it's absolutely both. And I think that that future, we're already seeing versions of that beginning to come to fruition. I think the thing that we're beginning to kind of understand, if you listen to Sam Altman from OpenAI to kind of talk about where he sees the future of some of these big AI kind of models going, is that we have the large language models that we know today. But what you're actually looking for is a, a, a raft of different assistance that will help you through each of those individual journeys. So Don, I think like your example there of the movie theater going experience, um, assuming that people will continue to just keep paying to do that, which I think they will, because I think it's important. Um, but in that in instance, like the question really there is not whether or not you will use your voice to do those things. I 100% believe you will. The question is, which companies and entities are you going to be talking to in that journey? Because right there, you spoke about Knives Out. Well, that's a Netflix movie. So am I talking to the Netflix assistant? You might have been doing it in your car. So are you talking to the Mercedes assistant? Uh, you might have been doing it as you were driving up to AMC in the parking lot and you did it when you kind of like drove in and you spoke to a kiosk bot that was sat there. Are you talking to the AMC assistant? When you rolled up and got your Coke out of the freestyle machine in the lobby, were you talking to the Coca-Cola assistant? So I think the reality is that all of those individual companies may have roles to play and we need them to because it's not in the interest of AMC to radically tune its model around knowing all of the movies that are on Netflix, nor is it in AMC's business to necessarily know all of the different flavor combinations of Coca-Cola. But Coca-Cola, it's absolutely in their business to know all the flavor combinations of Coca-Cola and maybe what snacks are on available and go with it. But they don't need to know anything about what movies are currently playing. And so the reason that you need these big language models is that they, they're they very generalized. What we need is then for companies, organizations, brands, and entrepreneurs to bring those large language models down into specific domains and train them to know the lexicon, grammar, syntax, slang, and you know, kind of nuances and user journeys of those very specific tasks where the brand currently plays that role today. And then crucially, and you know, it wouldn't be an OVON web webinar without me mentioning interoperability, then we need to make sure that we've got standards that allow those different assistants to carry that journey off you know, continuously throughout the, that whole experience. So I think that that future is definitely going to happen. But the idea that there's this kind of omnipresent single voice that carries you through all of those moments, I think that we're past the point of needing that to be a one size fits all kind of solution. Right. Would be my take. If yeah. I can add to that, if I can add to that, you know, one of the challenges with the with these large open ended models is is that we're all using our own instances of those models, right? And there's no data being shared across the across the gate. This is a common thing in healthcare too. I, you know, we have a, a I've, I've helped a, a series of health. I've been an advisory and helped a series of healthcare companies in my past. And one of the biggest challenges is is that the data is so protected between instance to instance, user to user, ball to ball, right? Uh, I think the inter interoperability aspect of it is incredibly important. And, you know, uh, when you create a platform, see one of the other challenges, and this this is something that is, is kind of close to my heart, you know, back in the day when, when the, the web was early, there was a real focus on storytelling and experience, you know? And uh, through, the, uh, through the evolvement of Apple, for example, uh, we really started to focus on utility. You know, those the apps really, really, really honed in on utility and it was standardized. It's like, you're going to use our calendar. You're going to use, you know, our uh, um, input field or our, you know, drop-down box or whatever it is, right? So one of the really interesting things is that, uh, is that we actually lost a lot of um, storytelling, a lot of narrative moments because everyone was confined into basically creating it within these confines, which, you know, truth be told, made a lot of sense. Now everyone's learning a learn behavior. They can do these things in a certain way. But what's really exciting is, is that the guardrails are off. When the guardrails are off, that's when true innovation can happen. Because people can then, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I'm sure companies on this call can then start to create things that are pure in the sense of what they wanted to try to achieve from a, from a user's perspective. So that's, that's really exciting to me, uh, you know, and I, I think that that's going to create a big opportunity. But I, I also believe that a huge win is going to be in how companies share this data, share the understanding. What is the, what is the interoperability between 
my instance of you know uh, you know uh, this language or this platform versus your instance of another platform right that's when we start to get into some really fascinating um experiential opportunities i agree mike if i could add on one thing too donald i was going to mention that about the data and uh the neutral collection of it because at ces um the walmart store eight i'm i'm um forgetting the woman's name who was amazing talked about the personalization that walmart is targeting and, and mike exactly to that example of of all these um siloed um, activities, voice activities on your journey to the movie theater, um, if it could capture as far as the kind of car I'm driving, the movie I'm seeing, who I'm with, what I'm ordering, it's going to be a better user experience overall for me and not those individual brands. You know, I, I think that's, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, James. Sorry. Sorry, Mike. I was just going to say, I think that this is also where it becomes that we have to kind of be careful about what we mean by interoperability because we that can sometimes mean like oh just everything is open and data can flow between these different things and they all operate on the same standard that's one aspect of that but actually i think as uh, so the conversation megan was referring to is that we had at, at ces with uh, dominique uh, essig from from walmart was that also you still need some of the big players in these industries to hold the keys um, because you're not going to want to entrust your personal data with every X, Y, Z, and you know, kind of tiny company. The smaller and smaller you go down, and that's why we've ended up with you know on the web today standardization around you know single sign-on with Google, single sign-on with Microsoft or Meta. Because quite frankly, you just don't want to remember that many passwords, oh, yeah. and also you trust these big organizations with that level of data. No matter how much we say we don't trust them, you're single signing on with Google left, right, and center all day long if you're like me. And I think that we need to find the voice voice and conversation the equivalent of those paradigms because otherwise this kind of many assistant model actually will really fail to take off if there isn't a consistent way of taking your identity with you from one place to another i know mr novak in the chat is going to chime in, in a minute about some kind of blockchain based identity platform which also will require a big company to scale it therefore not being that decentralized i'm going to leave that point over there but like <laughs> that's that's what we actually need to see kind of come about at the same time as these um, many players entering at the same time. I, yeah. I always use, I always use um, credit cards as a, as a pathway because back in the early days when credit cards were first introduced, the fear related to credit cards and applying transactions online was insane. And still, and still is high here in Europe. I'll just add the international aspects of it, but not Absolutely. in the UK so much, but our colleagues in Germany and, and Eastern Europe, very much still um, harder to get people transacting with credit cards online. South America too, I think is a challenge. Yeah. Awesome. You know, but the platforms, the eventual involvement of those platforms like PayPal or, you know, the other, other transactional platforms, those did uh, do exactly what you mentioned, James, which was kind of bring everything together. So you're going to use, you know, a developer's not going to go out and create their own, you know their own um, uh, transactional platform, which which we did back in the day. I mean that was that happened. <laughs> you know, yeah, like, everyone building their own for, payment gateway was not a good plan. <laughs> oh, it was just it was a br brutal experience for everybody at the time. But but I I think that we're going to go through the same uh, um, growth pains uh, in 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 whatever medium. And I, I but and I think that it's actually tied to, in a lot of ways, not just the not just the essence of of uh, you know the 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 need, but it's the want. You know, I, I'm a big, I was just going to, I'm a big Curb Your Enthusiasm fan. I don't know if you, if you folks, I love that show. I see he just, it, I mean, it just laugh every time the show's on. If, if I didn't have access to HBO when, uh, when that show came on, right, um, I would pay for it. And even if it was painful, I'd still pay for it, right? Because I want it. And that's where the want or the need versus the, um, versus the, you know, the, the hump that the user needs to get over outweighs it. So they actually do the transaction. They actually do the thing, right? And and this is where I always go back to. Even when I was talking to, uh, even when I was dealing a lot with the with the AR VR Association and you know, doing all that type of stuff, it's about the experience. It's about the want. It's about the utility. And the better the experience, the want, or the utility, the better, the more likely. I'm not saying it's a guaranteed success. But more likely, you will be to you, that you will succeed in your ability to convert your users or your customers. You know, um, something that was been talked about a lot in the thread. Um, they're talking a lot about B two B versus B two C, right? B two B is much harder to convert one customer. The advantage of a B two B customer 
is that it's it's um it's scale quickly right that's the advantage so so the truth is is that i think that there are some really big opportunities in b2c around leveraging all these new technologies for new experiences um, that's why i doubled down in what i'm doing now personally right um, because if you can basically create something that people really love and, and want to be a part of it's easier to sell you know one person at a smaller dollar amount than to sell one person at a giant dollar amount with lots of implications around their business right and then you just have to do it over and over and over again so i think that there are some huge opportunities in b2c which are not uh being explored in the same way uh that b2b is and and obviously i'd actually like to, to ask that question uh for for megan you know investment typically i mean you, you know historically is always b2b it's it's usually SaaS models it's something that is very fundamental that you can be like you plug it into your sheet and then you spit out a thing it's like yes this company is fundable <laughs> right you know <laughs> historically right but the truth is is that the win from my perspective is with innovation where companies are trying to do something out of the confines of the existing uh box structure you know so i'd love to hear your perspective on that yeah you're absolutely right mike on uh our, our focus and most uh investments in my experience is b2b SaaS models um, are the um, really going to get us our returns? You know, an, an example I just uh, thought of. Did you? I don't know if you saw the um, the um, the chat with Ryan Reynolds when he created the ad for Mint. And I think okay. it be a consumer influence because consumers are more techno technology savvy of driving the B two B need for uh, conversational AI um, technology. So I, I think that that is going to be uh, an expansion um, as um, more uh, examples like that come out. So I'm being told that we are at time. Uh, Nathan Southern is a tough taskmaster. We are at the end. We can always go uh, hours and hours beyond our allotted time with these conversations. They're, they're fascinating and enlightening. Um, I, for one, took away a number of um, headline points, uh, not least of which was the the notion that uh, we do need some larger entities keeping their hands uh, in this um, ecosystem to make certain that it flows and it, it moves. I, I've i always advocated for, on the media side of voice, which is still an immature uh, business, that someone like the trade desk is going to have to step in and make some sense of it, you know, to avoid lots and lots of hair pulling at you know at agencies and media buyers and planners desks um so thank you for that point and for all the points that our panelists made and for all the questions that were posed in the chat and in the q a there's never enough time to get to all of them um but i do thank you all for your attendance uh and i thank you our um panelists for taking the time out of your busy days to join us today. And this concludes um, Monetizing Voice, Show Me the Money, part three. And we wish you the best uh, for the rest of your week and in the weeks to come. Thank you. Thank you.